in January of this year, I had surgery. And while I was at the hospital, I had one bag of clindamycin. Now, I had talked to my doctor ahead of time, and we both agreed that there was not a lot of merit or need for me to take oral antibiotics after the surgery. So, hooray, I spared my microbiome, right? Well, not as much as you would think. I mean, I'm glad that I didn't take the extra antibiotics that clearly weren't necessary for me, but I am genuinely shocked what one single bag of clindamycin did to my microbiome. Now, for those of you who are not new to this channel, you already know, I have done a lot of stool testing in the last year. I did an experiment with prebiotics where I would do stool testing pre and post intervention. I did one with a veggie mashup experiment. And I amazingly have, can say that I have 23 stool samples. Well, 23 samples from Ombre and six samples from BiomeFX to go off of as my pre intervention data set. And then after the fact, after my surgery, when I realized that I was struggling with way more constipation than was normal for me, I went ahead and I did eight stool tests over the course of a week. And that is our post intervention data set. So here we are, we've got 23 ombres versus eight ombres, six biome FX versus one new biome FX at six weeks post op. Let's go ahead and take a look at what one single bag of clindamycin did to my microbiome. I go ahead and give myself a head bubble here. And here we go. So let's go ahead and just start with the biome FX. For those of you who aren't familiar, I already did a couple of videos talking about this and uh, using this in some of my data. This is a whole genome sequencing test, which is a wonderful tool, particularly for assessing diversity. And that's one of the things that I was really concerned about after having had antibiotics, is that antibiotics are known to decrease your diversity, and that's something that I wanted to check out. So let's go ahead and scroll a bit, and we will see, boom, oof, alpha diversity firmly in the red zone. Now, I will say, remember, there's another video in this series, and in that video, I'm going to talk about the fact that one single data point doesn't share the whole story. Multiple data points give us a clearer picture. So you look at that and you think, man, oh man, is that bad. But my alpha diversity from the six tests that I had done previously ranged from anywhere from 2.03 to 2.59, upward of 5.75 was the high for alpha diversity in those previous samples. So we don't know for sure that that is as atrocious as it looks. Had I not cheapened out, had I done three biome FX samples like I did previously for the other experiments, maybe this would be a little bit prettier, but this is definitely the lowest alpha diversity I have had out of the seven biome FX that I have done now. So I think that that is telling in and of itself. It definitely seems to have lowered my alpha diversity. Granted, we only have one data point to go off of. Now, my beta diversity doesn't look half bad. Actually, that is the second highest beta diversity that I have had using this test. So that was kind of interesting. I think that goes to show you that a lot of us have had a lot of antibiotics because beta diversity is just telling us, are the microbes that I carry similar to those the, of people who live in my area of the world? So if you were to sample somebody else from the continental United States, you would probably find very similar bacteria compared to what they found in my sample. That's basically what they're saying. But that didn't budge. Actually, that looks pretty darn good. Alpha diversity, though, the one that really matters more, in my opinion, did seem to go down at least a bit. Now, scrolling on. Another thing that I wanted to show you guys here was the pathogen uh, species that they assessed. And neither of these really were too far out of whack. In a couple of my previous BiomeFX samples, there were a couple other species that they detected that were within the normal range, but detected nonetheless. Um, in this case, C. diff, basically the same as it was before. My average from my previous three Biome FX samples, which I had done around the new year, the average was 0 0.0379, and now I'm at 0 0.04, which is practically the same thing. Uh, Bilophila maybe went up a bit. It's It's... You know, I didn't have Bilophila on all of my samples even, but Bilophila, the average for the previous three Biome FX stool tests was 0 0.0250, and now it's at 0 0.08. So that did basically triple 
from the last sample. Now you'll see it's still within the range, but it did triple from the previous sample, which I thought was kind of interesting. But let's get to the really juicy part. You're here for the juice, right? Here we go. And I need to figure out a place to put my head bubble that makes sense. Here, I'm just going to I'm just going to put myself right there. Okay. Let's get a little before and after action going. First, I will draw your attention to Acromancia mucinophilia, which is a really important member of the microbiome, particularly if you don't want leaky gut, which I do not. And you can see that this is not detected. Mer, mer, mer. But if you look at my previous three, it was absolutely detected and it was even elevated slightly in two out of the three previous samples, which is kind of horrifying. So we have one test, the Biome FX, suggesting that acromancia took a big, big hit from that single bag of clindamycin. Now I'm going to show you in a couple minutes, the ombre data does agree with that. Ombre doesn't think that it's gone, which I'm relieved to find out, but ombre does agree that acromancia took a pretty substantial hit. Now for the phylum data here, we, uh, or I'm sorry, not, um, well, the phylum is actinobacteria, but looking here, when this test looks for bifidobacterium, they are only looking for two specific named species. I don't think there's a part in this test that looks at the whole genus of bifido, although I could be misremembering that. Um, and if you look, both of these are detected in this post-antibiotic sample, which is good, um, versus one not detected, both are there, and one not detected from my previous three samples. So bifido seem like they're doing about the same, give or take. Now let's go ahead and we'll look at some of these Permichetes members, starting with the top half. So you can see that the only one that's not detected is this Ruminococcus species, but otherwise all of the top half of this, all the way down to Eubacteria and Rectale, looks like they are at least detected. Looking back at my previous three BiomeFX samples, uh, we've got, there was a Roseberry intestinalis was not detected in that one, but otherwise similar. Roseberry intestinalis, again, not detected and not detected here. So in this case, it almost looks like I gained a species, which is interesting. Now, Aubrey disagrees with that. They say that I've had Roseberry intestinalis all along, um, chalking it up to just difference in technology here. But I found that very fascinating. Now I want to draw your attention down to the last couple, which are the lactobacilli. So you could see lactobacillus rhamnosus, gone, ruteri gone, and total lactobacillus species is not detected. So that's zilch. If we look back at my previous three BiomeFX tests, those two specific species, rhamnosus and ruteri, are indeed not detected. But I had some other lactobacilli hanging around, which apparently are not hanging around anymore. So they're there. And look, you can see one of them actually. Um... I mean, it was low, but it was still there and it was fine in the other two samples versus not detected in this recent one. Now let's go ahead and compare this to what I found on Ombre, because like I said, I only have one data point for BiomeFX because this is a more expensive test and I got cheap. I didn't want to drop another thousand dollars on BiomeFX for this video, uh, but I did do a whole bunch of Ombre for you. So uh, now this, I'll just show you, this is one of my mega spreadsheets for these experiments. So I've got the date of the stool sample and the numbers, and you could scroll for what feels like years. Uh, what I am going to show you for this video is right here. So we're looking at the pre-antibiotic average, the post-antibiotic average from the eight new samples, and the change overall. So you could see here, interestingly enough, Formicides went up a little bit, about 11% or 11, 12%, which I think is a good thing. And proteobacteria went down. The bad guys went down. How wild is that? So at least the dysbiosis I have is not an overgrowth of bad boogeymen. I guess I could be thankful for that much. So that was a very interesting shift. And then bacteroidetes basically stayed the same. Then if we come down here to the genus level, let me scroll down. This is where things start to get a little spicier. Uh, Prevotella and bacteroides, not a huge difference there in at least in this conversation. Look at bifido though. The average from the first 23 samples, no, that's a lie, 22, there was one that was a total outlier and I deleted that from the pool. But the, the average for bifido from the first 22 samples was 1.29 versus now 0.35. 
So that went down 72.8%. That's a pretty significant drop. Similarly, lactobacillus, you can see it's still there, thankfully, at least according to Ombre. But you can see I was cruising right around a half a percent, which is pretty darn good. Now I'm at 0.023%, which is quite bad. So that dropped about 95%. One bag, people. <laughs> One bag of clindamycin. This stuff is wild. Then scrolling down to our friends, the butyrate producers, uh, a few of them really shifted quite profoundly. All, all of them shifted, but uh, butyravibrio went up by 230%. So whatever space was created from the antibiotics, clearing other stuff out, apparently butyravibrio was very happy about that. Um, Copper coccus went up about, or it went down 60%. So that one, not so happy. Fecalobacterium went up 50%. We're going to see this on the species level as well. And Roseburia went up 45%. So I don't know what the discrepancy is there between the two tests, uh, but you could see clear as day, Roseburia was there all along. So I don't know why BiomeFX isn't picking up on it, or I don't know if Ombre's making shit up. I don't know. Uh, pun totally intended, by the way. And then you could see some of the bad boogeymen that I look for. Uh, they did shift a bit, so you could see uh, some of these other Enterobacteriaceae family dropped by about 77%. Not sure why I didn't highlight that. Allostipes dropped by 68%. Desulfa vibrio dropped by half. That's one of the hydrogen sulfide producers. Streptococcus went down by 68.9%. Um, we've got some pretty notable shifts. Interestingly, very interestingly and unexpectedly, you could see here that Methanobrevidibacter the, the, uh, the species of archaea, or rather the genus of archaea that produces methane, that one's gone. I went in the CSV files. I can't find it anywhere in any of the eight samples. So that one might legitimately be gone, which is very unexpected and very fascinating. Hold on. Let me just uh, highlight these couple. So draw your attention to those. There we go. So there's the other ones that really changed. So again, other Enterobacteriaceae family dropped 77%, Streptococcus dropped 68%, Desulfa vibrio dropped 50%, Methanobrevidibacter looks like it's gone, and Allostipes dropped by 68%. Very fascinating stuff. Now let's move on to the species, and then we're going to bring this home. We're going to give you some takeaways. So again, we've got some individual species. Again, you can see Roseburian test analysis was there all along. Freaking BiomeFX. Don't know what you're thinking about over there. Uh, I'm going to choose to believe the one that's more optimistic for me. But you can see Fecalobacterium presenitzii went up almost 50%. Acrobantia freaking mucinophilia. Look at this, people. My pre-antibiotic average was 3.63%. That is brag worthy. That is so good. And now it's down to squeaking by at 0.178%. It dropped by 95%. Holy macaroni. So you could bet your bottom dollar, you know what I'm doing right now? I'm eating all the polyphenols I can get my hands on. I've eaten olives, green tea, dark chocolate, berries, you name it. I am trying to feed this little stinker like there's no tomorrow because it took a major hit. Now, Roseburia intestinalis also looks like it took a pretty big hit, which is interesting because, again, that does conflict with this. If you look, Roseburia intestinalis is detected in this BiomeFX sample, but it was not detected at all in any of the previous three. So I don't know what to make of this one. I don't know if it was gone and I suddenly gained it back or if it was very, very low and I gained it back, basically. Or I don't know if I should believe Ombre and say that this one took a really significant hit. I don't know. Theoretically, BiomeFX should be more accurate at the species level. So maybe I should believe them, but I honestly don't know. Uh, and then last but not least, I will point out one potential bad boogeyman did pop up a bit more, and that was Bacteroides fragilis, now, again, like this, this amount of B. fragilis, I'm not worried about whatsoever, but it did go up from 0.065 to 
which was about a 74% increase. B. fragilis is one of those bacteria that it can be bad or it can be good. And we don't usually know from looking at stool testing. We kind of are making assumptions based on the presentation of the individual person. Uh, but there are some strains that make a B. fragilis toxin, and there are other ones that are quite friendly and nice and and they're fine in your ecosystem. So for this data point, I don't know if I'm going to chalk it up to a good thing or a bad thing, but that is a potential bad boogeyman. It's just we can't really tell from this particular test. So let me get out of head bubble mode. Hold on. And bring it home because like always, you're not watching these videos for fun. You're not watching these because you're in some weird Nikki fan club. You're here because you want to feel better and you want to make sense of the world and figure out where to go from here. Um, my takeaway from this is that IV antibiotics are no joke. <laughs> and I know that that's kind of a dumb takeaway. Um, Amy and I did a whole episode about antibiotics on the IBS Freedom podcast. And we talked all about that. I think that was my first episode back from the surgery, actually. And I did discuss some of the research where they have looked at the gut microbiome after administering IV antibiotics, and it does seem to affect the gut microbiome. So I knew that going into this, and I knew this postoperatively. I didn't know it was going to be this much, though. To drop my acrobancy at 95%, and to drop bifido and lactobacilli by 70, 80, 90% both is just completely wild to me. And I, this is what I do for a living. I talk about poop and stool tests and microbiome tests all day long. So, you know, honestly, um, I'll, I'll share with you guys. I found out officially today that the ear surgery was a failure, which really sucks. So I still have a big old hole in my ear. It's just as big as it was before the surgery. Um, it's, it's really frustrating. I'm still kind of processing the disappointment. Um, but I was talking to my husband about it and I was telling him, well, I'm sure as shit not doing the left ear now. Cause I, I have a perforation on this side too. And I said, I'm not going to do the other surgery now. And he, you know, he was kind of in the mindset of, well, you might as well, you know, maybe the one will succeed still. And you might as well try it because we've already met your out of pocket maximum. So the surgery is basically free at this point, hashtag America. Um, but I, I told him, I said, but that one bag of antibiotics really decimated my microbiome. Even if the surgery is free and I don't have to pay for it, and even if there is some likelihood that the hole in my ear could be sealed, I don't know, like, is it worth the risk? If I do antibiotics twice less than 12 months apart, is that worth doing? I, I honestly don't know. I'm leaning towards no, but I'm still kind of noodling on this. And I still have to follow up with the ear doctor and talk about what all happened. But, um, but you know, I, this is making me really pause and think about IV antibiotics ever again. Uh, I did naively think that if they were administered in an IV, it wouldn't have as much of an effect on the microbiome. And I think that I pretty much proved that to be false here. Um, but yeah, I guess the whole point of this video is just be careful with antibiotics and use them only when absolutely necessary and treat them with respect and just, just be careful guys. That's all I've got. That's all I got. I don't have anything more profound to say, but I hope that this before and after was bare minimum fascinating, if not helpful. I hope it was helpful, but I don't know if it was because I really just told you to not overuse antibiotics, which you already knew. Um, so if it wasn't helpful, I just hope it was fascinating or interesting or it was worth watching this video. Thank you so much for tuning in and thank you for sharing these videos or my channel or my podcast, wherever you think it will help the most people. There are so many people out there suffering from IBS and SIBO and IBD and GERD and they're so miserable. And if even one of these videos helps people or touches people, then it's worth being here on YouTube. So thank you so much for helping me spread the word as much as possible. And I will see you back here and on the IBS Freedom Podcast before you know it. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.